very, very, very happy to kick off this conversation that is the first one that is open to the broader community with the, a person that was with us for the kickoff last year. And exactly one year ago, we were together at the United Nations in New York. So I'm very glad to have here with us today, our friend, Mark Brand. And I really wanted to have him as part of this journey because uh, actually he is really a role model for what uh, we were doing because you actually represent exactly the aim the soul and the action and the purpose of all the things that we always uh, share with with our with our community and so mark i i really would love to to share with us your story what you're doing what you have been doing in these months uh, during the the pandemic because i know and i was following you in the social media and all the things that you have been doing with your community it's incredible the numbers of meals that you have been sharing and providing so please the stage is yours and uh, let's start this journey together wonderful and i um, want to just take a moment to welcome everybody and see all these faces and I also want to take a second to recognize I'm coming in from Vancouver, um, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Skohomish, and tsleil people. So it is my gift that they have allowed us to be on their land um, to be able to come to you today. And in this time of uh, deep racial diversity that we're facing specifically in North America, but also globally, to also recognize that our work has been predominantly to center black, brown and indigenous voices. And so with that lens today that we discuss, please do keep in mind that the work that we develop is predominantly for black and indigenous populations. And in this time that I think we need to stay focused there um, and to get the ship righted. Uh, we're in a really interesting place. So that being said and being acknowledged, I am in Vancouver, just out this window right here. Um, British Columbia in Canada and outside here is the downtown east side and the downtown east side for those who've done any work or research in social impact um, is one of the largest areas of mental illness homelessness um, we have one of the deepest entrenched disenfranchised populations uh, in North America and globally and it's been a real tension point um, for people during this moment because they're starting to realize and see what we've always seen. And when I say we, I mean my team and my organizations that work here and operate along with hundreds of different organizations and allies trying to end poverty and homelessness. We're also trying to change the narrative around what that means. So I think starting with, you know, a base level of some of the terminology that I'm gonna use, when I say homeless, I don't mean the gentleman on the corner with the beard and the cigarette stained mustache and the dog and the sign and the can saying I'm hungry. I mean that 80% of people in North America are one paycheck or one couch sleep away from being homeless. Poverty is so deep rooted that a lot of people will experience homelessness in their, in their lives. And so what is, what is the definition? It means to not have a fixed address. So you could be sleeping in your car, you could be sleeping in a shelter, you could be sleeping on a friend's couch and that wears out and then you don't have a home. In this age of abundance that we live in, there is literally no excuse for anyone on this planet to not have a home. And so we say that poverty is an act of violence, that we commit it, that capitalism in intrinsically with politics has created violence against people who have less. And there's a system in place that encompasses food, agriculture, of course, the way that we work or who we work for or how we are born and essentially live in debt. Those systems are all intrinsic to each other and there is a better way to go about living. And so our organizations, I started my journey in food. And so I've been cooking now as of this year, date myself, my birthday's in 12 days. I'll be a 31 years in the food and beverage industry. I started when I was 14. Um, and I started by making pizza. And so I lied about my age and I got a job at a shopping center working at a pizza shop. And day two, I got taught how to make bread. Does anybody in the room know how to make bread? Jose's like, hold on, let me get both of my hands. Um, it's magic. 
you can't make bread and then not be completely and utterly intoxicated by food for the rest of your life. You take a few dry ingredients and one wet one and you have magic. You can feed and nourish people. It costs so little. And so that little seed was planted in my head, pun intended. And I got to travel around the world and do different things. And I was looking at my restaurant career the other day and thinking about all the different parts that I've played in it. And I've literally played every role. So dishwasher, doorman, I've worked every station online. I've been a pastry chef when mine left and went back to France and I'm terrible at baking. I've worked every single spot of that and had the deep honor of being able to, in my later career, convene people around food using it as the instrument for conversation and for advocacy and what I like to call soft advocacy. So I believe that nobody has ever come to a cause by being told they're a moron. Nobody's ever said, oh yeah, let me do this now that you think I'm an idiot, right? So if I have a conversation with you and I say, hey, you know what? In my journey, I learned these metrics around poverty and around hunger and around isolation and around addiction. And I'd love to share them with you. And maybe if you want to come spend some time with me, we could have dinner and you could hear from people with lived experience. They could tell you a little bit about their journey too. And then that opens a door for people to be involved. It's an invitation. And what our biggest issues that we face with advocacy is, <clears throat> and I said this in a talk and I've shared this with Sarah before, I was in Queens, New York, about two years ago this time, speaking to 250 advocates. And I was on a panel and the panel was about forgiveness, right? Like how do we truly forgive? And so on my panel was the daughter of the gentleman who the story of Hotel Rwanda was based on, incredibly powerful human right? Talking about those two tribes. There's another woman who runs wellness at Rikers, uh, which is a prison in New York City. So she teaches yoga to people who are multiple count murderers. And she talks about her experience with them. And while we're doing the panel at the end, there, we take questions from the audience. And I promise this will all tie together. And they say, Mark, what's our biggest issue that we're facing going forward? And I thought about it, I took a beat and I was like, do I say this? I said, yeah, I absolutely say this. And it sort of just came straight to me. And I said, our biggest problem is advocates. And the room kind of cocked its head at me and looked at me a bit funny because we're all advocates. I said, our problem is that we're arguably the most exclusionary group on the planet. And the tension continued to rise. And I said, if you don't speak our language, if you don't understand our cause, if you don't have our exact vernacular, if you haven't done your own research or your own work, we are very hard to get along with or if we'll engage you at all. And so the room kind of awakened and we had a very healthy discourse. A lot of people were very angry and we're like, of course, we have this anger. This is how I feel about food justice. This is how I feel about climate. This is how I feel about everything is that we have all this education in our heads as advocates and we refuse to invite anybody else to talk. Where do you start? You have to start somewhere and you have to be able to engage that conversation in a way of humility and empathy to say, I understand life is very challenging, but you're in this place right now and you have a privilege and with that privilege, you need to educate yourself and how can I help you learn? And so what I always hope in our classes is that people can step away with a couple of little stories that they can use in their own soft advocacy. They can take those pieces and say, hey, you know what I learned today? This is really interesting to me. Not that they take it as power, but that they take it as an opportunity, as an opportunity to engage in conversation. And then you start to open things. COVID has been like a slamming door in all of our faces, right? We're all now looking at all of the things that have always been there. So the stuff that I was just talking about, of course, we've been working on for decades and other folks have been working on, but it's come to this head of, wow, who is being the most affected by a global pandemic? Those without resource, those without proper food, those without proper access to medical care or shelter are most affected. And of course they are. They're most affected by everything, all the time. And so we have this tremendous opportunity to look and reshape our systems. Well, I got so excited. And this is an interesting thing. So I, I want to also table this. We're all holding two energies right now as we go through every single day. And one of those energies is pain, suffering, 
mourning. We've lost people. We continue to do so. Everything feels out of whack. And this side is tremendous opportunity, clarity, partnership, love at a, a level that we've never seen before, empathy at a level we've never seen. So it's okay to have those two things at the exact same time. It's actually very healthy to be able to recognize them both and hold them both as true and say, okay, what do I do? What am I going to choose today? Am I going to choose to let this overwhelm me or am I going to choose to do this? Right. And so in here we can honor and acknowledge this and then we can move into this every day. And so I'll just share a couple of the things that we've been working on and then Sarah any other prompts, I'm wide open to talk about obviously anything. And of course, anybody here, if you want to pop a question in the feed, I, I will definitely engage it. But one of the businesses that um, I established here is about two blocks from this one. I'm going to keep pointing out this way. And just so you have an awareness, a situational awareness, the downtown east side is one block that way. So right now, there's about 3,840 people living in the street. Um, it's the largest open air drug market, arguably in the world and suffering. The opioid crisis has hit here harder than anywhere. We lost 179 people last month. So that's where we're talking about. And my business is right there. And so it's a ground floor, what we termed as uh, back in 2011. I only laugh because people are like, what is it? And I said, it's a social impact incubator. And people were like, I don't know what that means. Um, they also didn't know what social impact meant at that point. So it's, it's been an interesting journey, but there's a kitchen there. It's about 2,200 square feet. And we have a diner that was converted that's been around for 60 plus years. It's not open right now. Um, there's a radio station that fronts the street. Uh, if anybody's ever seen the film, Do the Right Thing, you can imagine that booth. If you haven't, you should watch it. And then you can imagine what the radio station looks like. It's also really good for racial justice in this moment to see how little we've changed. Um, and in that space, we started a meal program in 2012. And that meal program was because the meal being provided to people in shelters or single room occupancies or SROs, as they're known, uh, wasn't adequate. It really was a scrape together soup kitchen style model of whatever we can crack a can of and get warmed up. And I would walk through the neighborhood and see styrofoam cups, just literally like coffee cups that you would get if you went to like Alcoholics Anonymous or something. There's really nasty styrofoam cups and they would be spilled on the street and with what looks like cat food. And I was like, I wonder, is this for people? And it would be everywhere. So imagine you're living in a situation where you might be facing addiction or mental illness. You're living in an eight by 10, which is the same size as a jail cell. Opportunities are very small. You feel like society's given up on you and you arrive to your one meal that you're going to get for the day and it's a styrofoam cup full of bullshit. That's how society is saying that we feel about you. And so we started ours in partnership um, with the Tiro Women's Resource Center, who we've been very, very close from, uh, an organization that I hold in great reverence that deals specifically with women and children fleeing violence. And they came to me and said, you're a cook, you run fancy restaurants, you must know how to do this. I was like, yeah, absolutely, I could do this. What's the budget? And they said, we have $1.67 a meal. Canadian. So about a dollar 15 us. And even with inflation, this wasn't the seventies. This was like nine years ago. I was like, how do we do that? Like, I'm not sure my garnish is more than that on my plates. Like, I'm not sure how we would possibly do this, but I knew that we had to. So they said, we would like you to start with hundreds. I said, I would like to start with one. We'll start with one building. And we chose the Gastown hotel, which is literally right here. And it was 80 residents. And I said, there's things that I'm more interested in. And we can talk about systems design in a moment. But I want to understand what the impact is. Because I know what I believe the impact of food is. On your mental health, on your physical body, on your community, on your ability to relate, on your ability to find upward mobility. All of that, intrinsically important. That's what I believe. But I can say that until I'm blue in the face. I have to show numbers. Otherwise, nobody's trying to listen. Right? They don't want to look at this anyway. So I said, I will do this pilot, absolutely. We'll do 80 meals a day, but we won't serve them individually. We'll only serve them communally. And the CEO looked at me and said, you're crazy. There's people in the building are fighting. They have mental illness issues. They have, this is a no-go, you can't do it. I was like, well, then I'm not doing it. This is my caveat. If we can't do it communally, I'm not interested in doing it at all. And by communally, I mean, we would serve a batch meal 
And then everybody in the building would serve each other, do the dishes together and congregate. So she essentially said, this is like pouring gas on a fire. I said, okay, well, give me three days. And if it's, if it's that bad, we can go to individual, no problem. I said, the second caveat I have is that in every single building, there is an incident report book. And I would like the, the incident report book, full NDA of what happened three months before the meal program. And then what happened three months after the meal program. And she said, okay, you obviously have to sign some things, but you can have that data. Why do you want it? I was like, just please bear with me. So in that incident report book, you could open it up and it would say, Jonathan lit his mattress on fire. We called the fire department. You know, Teresa kicked Danny down the stairs and we called the cops. Um, and so those are the incidents that would occur, right? So we go to put out our first meal. I'm so excited. I make a chickpea and kale salad with roast chicken and I'm amped. I'm like, this is going to be amazing. They're going to be so happy. And we send the meal over and people are furious. They are on medications. Some don't have teeth. They can't eat kale. They hate chickpeas. They want nothing to do with this meal. So I call pizza. Like I'm like, Hey, please bring pizza and save the day. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I genuinely have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know this population. Like I know that I care, but I don't know how, like how to engage. And so that was my first lesson in quick humility. And we don't know what we don't know. And our assumptions need to be tested before we launch anything. Right. Uh, so the next day, our first great meal went out. We did that testing. And in the three months between the two in that one building, 911 calls, emergency calls, which are extraordinarily expensive on a city or municipality, no matter where you live, were down over 30%. And just providing that meal and that sense of community, 30% reduction, not three, not 13, 30. So when we think about what it means to show people love and dignity and respect and allow them to interact with each other and not make the assumption that these people do X and these people do Y, that just everybody's a human and that they want deeply to connect. They just need a safe way to do it. So that meal program went from 80 to 800. And before COVID, we were serving just under a thousand a day. And those meals are created in my kitchen by people who are formerly incarcerated, facing um, street entrenchment, mental and physical diverse abilities, very specific language change there. I don't say disability, I say diverse ability. And I think that if you have something that is heightened for you, that's your superpower. That's not a problem, it's what you do better than anybody else. So we focus on that and our employment is over 60% people from that bucket. Um, and so those folks make the, the food for the people who are their neighbors and it goes out via electric tricycle. So there's electric trike that has um, got a big caddy on the back and those meals go into it. Because why make this food and worry about your supply chain and worry about all the deployments if you're going to send it out in a diesel truck and just undo the whole process, right? We have to think about planet and everything that we're doing. So during COVID, what do I do? My entire hypothesis is blown. You can't eat together. You can't even be around each other. So I've got a thousand meals a day that need to go out and they have to go out individually. What are we going to put in the waste stream? What does that even look like? What does delivery look like? Because we do a fresh green salad every day that comes from some urban ag around us and it's beautiful and healthy. And then we do this main course that's usually like a starch and a beautiful protein and like lots of other vegetables. How do you put that in a container? Well, you have to do multiple containers, obviously. So we went from doing 33 hotel pans to doing 3,400 individual containers in three days. And those containers, biodegradable and compostable, not just throw in the trash. How do you source that many? During COVID, how do you get anything shipped? How do you make these things move? And so it was an incredible and fun for me, systemic challenge of how do we rally everybody? So we did, and we were able to increase our, our output by 250% within a week. Now, to give you, again, scope, this is a 2,200 square foot kitchen that's staffed predominantly by people with diverse abilities in the middle of the opioid crisis, in the middle of the COVID crisis, and we still have to feed people. 
And the great thing for us is we're always in triage. This is how we live our lives. So because we have been prepping for this forever, because things go like this in a neighborhood where things are difficult, we have an, a model, we have an archetype. So not only did we create that for ourselves and for our neighborhood, we were able to share it outwardly to so many other organizations, both nationally and globally. It was a real source of pride for my team, but it was also an opportunity to, when you can't ship large amounts, to reevaluate our supply chain. Who are we buying from? Where's our dollar going? And when you go through and you cycle through staff, of course, some of that stuff gets a little less perfect. So it was an opportunity for me to reach out to all of our individual beekeepers, to our urban ag folk, to our supply chain people. Where are we getting our beef from again? Okay, well, let's pivot back over to this particular space and lessen the amount of red meat in our meals anyway, and just do all of these tweaks. So COVID was an opportunity for us to look at this. And we've never been in better shape as far as that goes. Um, and our neighbors have never been happier. Uh, outside of being isolated, uh, there is a moment of deep appreciation for what's going on. So our neighborhood has rallied and been able to, because of this moment, leverage politically and get over 300 people housed like that and get other people in shelter because of COVID. So COVID was like this leverage of, oh my God, there's this many people unhoused? That's crazy. People should all have homes, especially now because they might die. And we're in the background being like, don't say anything. Don't, don't say anything. Of course they might die. They might die from exposure. They might die from drug overdose. They might die from, but no, COVID, totally. Let's just talk about COVID if it gets people housed. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been able to, to do here on the ground. And then in uh, the United States, I created a program called Sharpen Up. Uh, and Amanda, yes, 365 days a year, we do 1,800 meals. Um, Christmas, Thanksgiving, any of the other colonial holidays that people celebrate, we absolutely show up every single day. Um, so how do we? So one of the things that Sarah and I met when I was doing in, in the United States, because I run this the same foundation, a Better Life Foundation in the U.S., was we do education and training. And we focus, again, on Black and Indigenous and Brown communities. So we work in the Bronx, work in Harlem, and I'm a culinary council member of the New York City Food Bank. So how do we train people, right? The, I hate this analogy, but I'll say it anyway, just contextually, teach a man to fish, right? That one. Well, how do we teach? Also, it should be teach people how to fish. We can update that for 2020. But how do we get people to understand more about their own food sovereignty and food justice? So just taking one quick step back, we talk about food deserts. That's not real. Food deserts occur when you're in the middle of the Sahara. That's a food desert. Food apartheid is what we're actually talking about. Neighborhoods that have been specifically designed around systemic racism. So people who are living in those neighborhoods don't have access to food. There's not a Whole Foods. There's a liquor store, there's six fast food outlets, and there's a gas station. So how do you even access food? You're trying to hold down three jobs, because minimum wage is far too low for anybody to survive. You're trying to feed your family, but you've been in this cycle of systemic poverty and racism, so you don't have the education around food. You just have never been taught, because when would you? So we do that work in person. We get together with people, we'll set up in community centers, induction burners, whatever we need to do, and we meet people truly where they are. We do a couple of things. We bring people to experiences outside of where they're entrenched and then we come to them. And so in design, I was like, how do we level this up? So instead of saying what's good enough during COVID, I constantly said to my team, what can we do better than we've ever done? How do we use this as an opportunity to try new things that we've never done? So this, we're convening right now. I could never get to all of you guys at one time or I can because we're here right now. So what would be the difference in cooking? I can bring a knife into it. I can get multiple cameras set up. We can do some production. We could absolutely do that. And then we could invite kids. So let's train the youth. There must be so much tension with small apartments of people between their families. Let's break that tension and let's deliver groceries. That's how I'm getting my groceries, right? Right now I'm getting delivery. Let's send everybody food and let's ask them what they want. Specifically, what do you like to eat? What are you allergic to? What are you sensitive to? What does your mom hate? Like, what are the things that you actually want? And so we curated 
delivery, groceries, got it to their doorstep, and then came in, myself and Chopped Champion from 2017 in the U.S. was on my board, Eris Johnson. And the two of us would join just like this, and we'd have all of the questions that people wanted to ask, and we would demonstrate it all. And we'd talk about it all, the difference in salts. We would talk about, you know, the boiling points of water, how to be safe around things, and just have fun. Then in the second part of the class, it would be a one-on-one. -on -one. So we just come into your living room, we send you groceries again, and we work on a recipe together. And little brother, your little sister, you want to bring your cousin, doesn't matter, I don't care, bring everybody. And we would just hang out and learn about food. One-on-one, -on -one, how could you be more safe? How could you be more open than being in your own living room? And we had more success than we'd ever had teaching. And then in the last part of the class, we had a celebration. So we sent groceries again. And then we said, you choose what you're going to cook for us and we're going to witness and we're going to watch and see and then we'll all eat together. Because convening and eating together, I thought this boundary would keep us from doing that. It doesn't. You show me your plate. That looks beautiful. Look at the sear on that salmon. Nicely, nicely done. And then we hang out and then I started to bring musicians in. So I have a musician come at the end and sing and beatbox and we can support them and give them money because they can't perform. And that's community. So when we're faced with adversity, we build with what we have. And sometimes we build things that are more beautiful than what we could do before. So now we're teaching these classes consistently, partnering with the Boys and Girls Club, further with the Food Bank. We have a pilot next week with them in New York. And all of the chef friends of mine that are unemployed, we want to put them to work doing something they actually care about. We've worked with grocery chains and suppliers. And so those are the few things that we've created during COVID that you can obviously tell I get very excited about um, because I've been locked in this space. So it's, uh, it's been challenging, but it's been a great time for innovation and a great time for reflection and integration and, and understanding. So I hope that's helpful. And I'm gonna answer this, what does a typical meal look like? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Where, where are you? Put your hand up so I can see you. Yay, hello. Um, no, the meal looks way better. So um, yesterday we had a uh, pulled beef on sweet potato mash and our salad was um, a selection of local greens with sunflower seeds, diced mandarin oranges, sun-dried tomatoes and a lemon vinaigrette. So we, we make meals that we would very much be excited to eat, right? And so um, presentation is very important to us. Um, flavors, big flavors are really important to us. Um, freshness is obviously important to us. And the meals also now come, so we partnered, I've, I left one part out. We partnered with a high-end grocery store here three weeks ago. And the same tricycles that deliver our food pick up what is their overflow or their waste. So this is high-end, right? So it's like sushi rolls and beautiful croissants and all of this food. We pick it all up, we bring it, we sort it into beautiful baskets and we deliver it with our meal program. So all of this extra food then goes out to the shelters into these SROs. So it's just sitting in a pantry and now there's an abundance. Um, and we're, we're keeping, let me just get the number right, 6,400 pounds of food per month on average out of the landfill because of that program. So the meal itself looks great. And then there's all this other stuff that goes along with it. And it's super exciting. I hope that answers your question. Do we make a portion of special meals for exceptions, of vegetarians, of course. Of, course. of course, when we opened our first restaurant, it was named after my mom, um, Benita, like another block and a half away from here. This is 2007. And we put right on the menu, we love vegans. And I had a Quebecois chef who hated me for it, um, but we got to a good place. It was like, everybody has diet restrictions one or the other. I am, I'm a nightmare to eat with, right? <laughs> As a chef, you would think I'm like, I'll eat everything. I can, but I can't. And so I'm like, ah, nightshades make me a little funny. I, I get all of it. And so you can't then say, they'll just deal with it. That would be the same as like saying the, the styrofoam cup, like it's, it's the exact same thing, right? You're further marginalizing a population that has no options. So of course, we address every single one of those options and, and work with it consistently because there's rotation. So I have a one employee that full time is my, what did we end up deciding 
her title was together, senior community advisor. <laughs> it sounds fancy, but what she does is liaises with all of the hotels and all of the people individually, daily, weekly, to make sure that everybody feels comfortable um, and that they're getting what they need. And then we adjust on the fly. So it, it's helpful. Um, so is there anything if we can, to... I would love to go back and talk a little bit about innovation. So last year, when we met the first time, uh, you came at our meeting point uh, with uh, a box full of socks. Mm. That message was pretty inspiring for me. So last year, when we were hosting um, our boot camp in New York, uh, we decided to, to host the boot camp um, not in Manhattan, but in Brooklyn, in an area that was, of course, an area with uh, many people with different disabilities and different issues, diverse ability, sorry. And so Mark arrived and said, okay, yeah, I'm a chef, but this is uh, for the team this week. And I was wondering why. And of course, uh, he told me why. And I started really understanding uh, how is important also to approach uh, the fact of making good in an innovative way. Because sometimes we all want to do good, but we're not following uh, the innovation process. We are not following the process that we were learning in the classroom together with Xavi also last week. So the need finding, understanding, listening, and so on. And so last week, just to give you a perspective of what we have been doing, we started really talking about uh, the importance of prosperity thinking, uh, the design thinking process, uh, building ecosystem, the resilience of communities, and all the things that you teach at Stanford. So he is also a professor of innovation. And I see innovation in everything he does every single day. So let's talk about innovating and doing good. I'm so good. It's glad that you guys have already started this. Before I do that, so Sarah says to me, we meet, right? And she said, I would love you to do this thing. And I would love you to come to the United Nations with us and do an address with us, which was incredible. We had so much fun. And then do a dinner. And I said, well, what is the space like? Like, what, what's the kitchen like? And she said, the kitchen? Like, yeah, well, we're doing a dinner, right? Like, what's the kitchen like? And she was like, there's a space and my team is there. And so I met Jose and Jose and I put together a five course meal for a hundred people of UN delegation and other um, on one induction burner. And we had one plug-in toaster, Jose, I think. And a lot of food waste because we decided- yeah, That's the best part. And so we worked with a, another group called Bad Apple in New York City that um, sells ugly fruit to hip kids in New York. So they feel like they're part of the process. It's brilliant. I love them. And I, we said to them, bring us, we need these ingredients, but bring us your waste. So the, the stuff that you can't, you, the ugly food that you can't sell, we'll take that. And so Jose and I spent the day processing and making all sorts of fun food out of it. And we didn't tell anybody that. We just served them the dishes. Here's our take on chicken and waffles. And it was uh, roasted cauliflower that we had kind of tried to work on a barbecue and Jose made these beautiful dehydrated waffles out of corn husks and we smothered it with agave syrup and all this stuff and we were serving people like this is the best thing ever. and so when we presented we were like cool this was all garbage <laughs> and so it's this this opportunity that when you can build trust and define like what that's going to to look like you have the opportunity to change people's entire perspective through experience. And I love that. And it's what I love about the rapid prototype. And it's what I love about innovation and design. So you guys have learned, obviously, the, the steps. And I, I have to tell you, design thinking was a language, not something I already understood it intrinsically. I just didn't know that there was a language and a process. So entrepreneurs are design thinkers. It's, it's what we do. Hustlers are design thinkers. It's what they are, right? They're like, oh my God. So what is, I'm going to test this. I'll ID, I'm a prototype. I would need to define it. I need to empathize with who I'm working with. You already know all of this stuff. You just don't say the words. And if there's no rigor to the process, you fail, right? Because you haven't done the steps. And so when I learned about design thinking, I was forced into essentially doing it with the Think School of Leadership. It was based out of Amsterdam and they had a cohort here in Vancouver that I was a part of. And it blew my mind. I was like, 
oh, these are the words I've always been looking forward to essentially make what we do real to other people to say, oh, we're design thinkers. And people are like, what does that mean? Like, it's what we already do. So of course, in the tiles or the hexagons that you've seen that are, have been shared from the Stanford D School a, a hundred times, that's where I ended up doing a fellowship. So I did a fellowship there for almost a year um, in poverty and technology. So going all the way over to this side, we had created a few things that I'll talk about that had piqued the interest of Stanford and they asked me to come be a civic innovation fellow. And so in that time, I like became much more aware of the importance of real, true ethnography. And I can't pause enough on this. I can't say enough about ethnography and proper interviewing and synthesizing. We have assumptions. We read, we read, we read, we listen, we listen, we listen, but we're not engaged. So in the time that I was in Stanford, I did over a hundred ethnographic interviews with people who were facing street entrenchment, right? So that's me sitting down for minimum an hour and a half, sometimes two, sometimes four, and just listening and being present. We have a default built into us <clears throat> around empathy that we have to turn off. There's a switch we have to turn off. And that switch is to relate. Oh, me too. Yeah, no, oh, my cousin. No, you will never ever get the information that you wanna get by relating. You have to give space. So active and deep listening is a skill set that design thinking intrinsically teaches, but that we should all have. Have you ever been the person who's like sat down and wanted to share with somebody what's going on for you and they want to solve it for you? Like, I don't need you to solve it. I just need you to listen to me. I just need you to hear me. And so in ethnography, while we're listening, we learn the most incredible things, whether we're working with farmers, whether we're working with fish farms in Iceland, if we're really listening, we can hear the issues because you open a space of sharing and trust that people are not used to. They're not used to, right? We don't give that to people. So if you can be that, that is the absolute hack to being successful in, as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, as a human being in a relationship, all of these things. So my mom said to me when it went on the first, the wall of my first restaurant, imagine, so this is like a booth, a VIP booth in a fancy restaurant. And on the wall, I wrote the words my mom said to me when I was 12. And it said, Mark, there are two types of people in the world. Those who wait to talk and those who listen. I was like, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> At 12 or 13, as I got older, I was like, oh, I get it. You're not... It's not a competition, it's not a battle. If you're really listening and reflecting to somebody, you can get to anywhere in innovation because you uncover the nugget, right? We say, what was the key insight? Well, you'll never hear the key insight if you're not listening or you're pushing your agenda. And in conversation, we often push our agenda. And sometimes we do it subconsciously. Often we do it subconsciously because we have a result. And if we're really truly doing social impact work, we can't work to prove our hypothesis. We have to prove, we have to work to uncover what we don't know. They're very different things. So you could spend a year researching something and bring it into a conversation and then have that conversation for it to be blown up. And you have to be okay with that because the truth is that it's not going to work. And where we fail over and over and over again, is by our ego holding on to the thing that we said we knew was true, even when it's not. That's where we fail. So we have to so often just be like, wait a second. That plus that plus that proves that this isn't right. That's excellent news. Because now I've uncovered something else and you just go that way. So that's what we say, we say iterate. That's the iterative process. Right, that's that's how it works. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming, Sarah. And I want to get to some of them. Is it okay yeah. that I jump? And then I want to take them because uh, absolutely are relevant question. And I, I I'm gonna pick Anastasia question because it's pretty linked to the the, the following uh, 
thoughts that I had. And of course, she is wondering uh, from your point of view, what's the added value to be not just an entrepreneur, but being a social entrepreneur. And here, I want to build something on top of that because uh, of course, for people like me, trying to build an ecosystem, try to go, do good, connect the dots uh, and try to scale up the good. When I find people like Mark, that is such a strong person and coherent identity, always following uh, uh, something, a process that is pretty straightforward uh, and uh, his integrity is 100% coherent with what he's doing. It's really amazing. And also, he's a successful entrepreneur in doing good. So this is, a, I think, a crucial question for all of us here around this table and all the people that are investing time and in listening our conversation, because uh, we also need to, to make it sustainable from every perspective. This is an entire lecture. This is like, just before I start to, to talk about this, this is like a six month course. Right. <laughs> but I will give you the top lines. For the entire it, life trying to. <laughs> oh my, and I'm, I'm just getting started. Right. So uh, let me start with the most important parts that I think that you can apply immediately. Like there's, and so I'm going to go, I'm going to go out here and then I'm going to get very granular. All right. In the out here, and I promise this is a hundred percent fact. There's not a maybe, not like a, oh, that's nice to say. No. If you give, and you build into every single day of your life a way to be in service to people. How do I help others? I promise you it comes back a hundredfold. In the moments where you think everything's going to fall apart, your community is there. The only thing that has ever kept you safe and that will ever keep you safe. It isn't money. It isn't stocks. It isn't your property. It isn't your, none of those things, that stuff, that stuff does nothing. Okay, a financial crisis hits, none of your stuff is worth anything. A natural disaster occurs, none of your stuff is there anymore. Then what? Your community is the only thing that keeps you safe. It is what you build for. So you give to it. Not to the point that it hurts. You don't have to. You build structures of reciprocity and how does, it, how does this whole energetic thing work? And people are like, wow, that's so innovative. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's what we did. It's how we're built. And if you go to small communities, it's how they work. It's literally how they work. Barter and trade is still very alive. And it's not who can get the best deal. It's just giving. I make bread, therefore I share bread. I fish, therefore I share fish. The thought of this, and there's a person that I want you to watch a video on or, or look up. Her name is Zita Cobb, Z-I-T-A-C-O-B-B, -B, from Fogo Island. Friend, peer, incredible woman. The place that she's created in Fogo Island just got rated the third best luxury hotel in the, on the planet. She built it and based it on reviving an entire community that she invested in. That community sews tapestries, builds chairs. Like there's an ability that they bring their skill set to the table. So you have to define what you're really great at, what you love doing, and apply that and give stuff away. Now, I know that's a bit up here, okay? So I'm going to bring it down. It's so important to have multiple revenue streams. How do you keep your business alive, right? So in every business that I operate, and at one point we were operating 11, I was operating 11 um, with 13 different cost centers in this neighborhood. You can imagine, it was madness, absolute madness. We loved it, but it was based on seeing somebody's light and energy and what they bring to the table and what they want to do and then helping amplify that and helping create a structure around it, right? So what does that look like? So at the Save on Meats business, which is now pred predominantly a Better Life Foundation, you heard me talk about it. We have a diner, radio station, takeaway counter, commissary kitchen, catering, token project. We have a dinner series monthly called the Greasy Spoon Diner. We have an, an opportunity called Plenty of Plates that was happening multiple times a week. We host community events and the list goes on forever. It's all the exact same thing. None of it. So when people say, how do you control and manage all these businesses? They're the same. It's all one purpose and one goal. And so you start to see the lines that intersect with them and how they can support each other in a way. And you start to pull those lines together and you have to name them. You can't just like have them. 
you have to say chef from here and chef from here, you guys need to interconnect on our supply chain so we can lower our costing and share. Maybe you're gonna use the juice at the cocktail bar, that's fine. You're gonna use the rinds for our dessert program. Like that's, it's simple, right? So you look at all of the stuff and as you're giving, your reputational value goes through the roof because people, particularly Zeds, Xs, et cetera, and below, all of these different gens, and I've been saying this for 10 years to corporations, I was like, look, if you're greenwashing or you're not actually doing good, you're already done. You just don't know it yet. You're unaware that you're no longer relevant. People will not purchase your goods. They won't. You're just, you're slow to catch up because the older folks are still alive and they're stuck in their way. Once they're gone, it's over for you unless you start doing real good. And when we look at like a Ben and Jerry's right now, these guys have been waiting for this moment. I love those guys. They've been waiting for this moment forever because people look at them and go, oh, are you, are you virtuous? Oh no, you've always been doing this work. You're a real company. Their stocks go through the roof. Their purchasing goes through the roof. People are like, wow, it's amazing. From some social posts, they didn't spend any money on it because they've been spending their money in community the whole time. So when you look and you vet somebody, you say, oh, okay, this product comes from X. Does it hold water? Is it real? We can do that from our smartphones on the subway, right? We know whether we can believe in something or not. So the other part that's really important, this is like, I got to say, this has got to be one of the key things. When you do impact work of any type, when you talk about things that make people uncomfortable or guilty, they will attack you. That just is. It just is. If you hold an opinion that is aggressive or contrary to where people feel comfortable, you will be attacked. Whether it be digitally smeared, those things will just happen. And they will happen because you're triggering in somebody else what they are sad about or what they feel guilty about or what that looks like. The only way to deal with that period, and I promise you after going through it for 15 years, is to just hold space for them to say, I hope, I hope whatever pain you're going through gets better and move on. You never, ever, ever engage. Never, ever, ever. Right? Because people are going through their own things. And there's all of the stuff that you're going to bring out of folks because it's their safety. And their safety depends on their stuff. And it depends on the narrative that they've created for themselves. So when you start to unravel that narrative and say, hey, the only reason that you're ahead in this game is because of systemic oppression for 400 years, that upsets people. <laughs> And like, I've worked hard my whole life. You're like, that can also be true. Those are also true. But what are you going to do with your privilege? So you have to ask yourself in design. You have to ask yourself in these projects. Why am I giving things away? Why am I engaging in this way? What is my time worth? Why do I build these businesses when this one over here shows me that I could build a unicorn and be a billionaire? Well, I promise you, I've had all of the money. I've had all of the things. Had is the operative word here. I no longer have them because they're not important to me. But when I had them all, and I know this is an old trope, but it's true. I was the least happy I've ever been in my life. I was the deepest in my addiction to alcohol and drugs. I was the worst version of myself. I was a bully. I was all sorts of things that I disliked because that chase of capitalism creates monsters. It just does. It's just that system is bad. So if you step away from it and say, what do I want with my life? What do I want to contribute? What matters to me? How will I spend my days? Because none of them are promised. Everything becomes crystal clear to you. And if you're struggling for your rent one month, you will look back on those times so fondly about the time that you had to struggle. You had to stretch out a loaf of bread. You had to do those things. Those are what give you the integrity and the honor that you build in. And you can't empathize any better than having been there, right? I hope that helps. Yeah, and probably this was answering also the question that Alessandro just posed in the chat. 
that was ask, asking, for example, where you have failed happily and learn a lot of things and things that you don't want to do in the future and so on. So, so many. And, and I hate, sorry, let me rephrase my language because I'm going to be reactionary here. I dislike the fail fast movement. I just like that whole analogy. I think it's silly. And I think it was opportunistic. I think people wrote books and made a lot of money based on other people going, oh, yeah, it's okay to fail. That makes me feel good. That was, that was not okay. Um, of course we fail. Fail every day. I literally fail every day. Like not maybe because we're attempting so many things, right? We're trying things. But that's, I think we are limited by our language sometimes, Right? And this is one of those instances, because what we're really talking about is putting energy after intention and it being diverted in the wrong, it went to the wrong direction. So you just move it. You try this one, you just move it. And eventually it gets to the place that you were trying to get to. You just didn't know. You didn't know exactly where it was supposed to go. And I'll, I'll tell the story about our token project, because I think it's, it's good. And how much time do we have, Sarah? I'm just being mindful. Are we Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we still have another half an hour, so let's go. Yes, uh, we, I'm feeling I, fired up for hours. Listening <laughs> <laughs> you. Okay, so um, I'm going to take this from the very back, and then we'll go forward. Okay. So in my neighborhood, I notice that there's a complete disconnect. So it's a gentrifying neighborhood. Okay, and for those that understand the terminology, um, gentrification happens when a neighborhood is typically affordable. In, in poverty most of the time, when cool guy businesses move in, they start to become less affordable. And then of course those buildings get purchased, real estate gets built and you have gentrification. People are pushed out of the neighborhood that they grew up in. The downtown east side and Gastown, these two neighborhoods are very much the center of that. But social housing is built throughout it. And that social housing is never going anywhere. It's locked down. So you can imagine you have a million dollar apartment right here and holding the same wall is a $280 SRO. That creates incredible tension because people are seeing how we failed society every single day while trying to enjoy the things that they were promised by capitalism, right? So you have this in the streets, people being like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So I have always believed that it's not anger. I believe that it's pain. And I think the two are directly correlated, of course, but how do we design for it? So I'd say to people, why don't you engage with folks in the street? Why don't you? Like, why don't you give money? And you watch people squirm when you ask that question, right? Because they don't want to say something stupid. And they also don't want to tell you the truth because the truth makes them feel guilty. Like, please just say the truth. Like, I feel like they're going to use this money for drugs or alcohol. Now, that sucks. But this is the largest open air drug market in North America. Drugs are being purchased somehow, right? So that's something that the people are holding. And that's the reason they're not giving money. It's like, okay, lots of people do give money. And I totally tell people to do that. Like, by all means, engage however you feel comfortable. But for those who are uncomfortable, we created a small coin about this size, right? It was plastic, recycled plastic. And on one side, it said sandwich. And on the other side, it had the logo. We have a three-story neon sign that you cannot miss. It's one of the last ones that stands in Vancouver. It's got big pigs on it with dollar signs on their chest because it was a butcher shop. And so the logo's on the other side. So if you're new to the neighborhood, great. If you're, you've been in the neighborhood, it's a beacon for you anyway. So I said, you can buy these. I think we started $2.50 or something. And if somebody asks you for money because they're hungry, you can hand one to them. And they can come into my diner any time of the day or night and redeem them for one of six sandwiches. Vegan, gluten-free options available, of course. And I thought at best we would do two or three a day, but that's two or three conversations that weren't being had, right? Super cool. Somebody's going to look at somebody else who's super isolated, who's street entrenched, who's feeling like everybody doesn't care about them and engage. And that person who's engaging is going to change their perspective about what is happening there. Because once you have a conversation with somebody, we're built, we're hardwired to care. And so I was like, this will be great. Two or three a day, that'd be amazing. The first day we did 120 redemptions. It like caught like a wildfire. We were on the front of all the papers. I was being asked to do national press. 
And then on the other side of that, people were very angry. Advocates were furious. They were like, you're saying, me, you're saying that homeless people can't be trusted with money. He was like, no, I didn't, I definitely didn't say that. What I said was people aren't engaging and I wanted to design a way for them to start to engage because then maybe they will give money afterwards and get more involved in this. No, they weren't having it. People were furious. So on one side you have this and on the other side you have this wave of humans, which was 98 to 99% rushing in the door, kids having lemonade stand sales to raise money for tokens. And it was amazing. We've never had so many incoming queries about how to do a thing. Now, Sandwiches aren't innovation. We've been making sandwiches since we could slap two slices of bread together. Currency is obviously not innovation. We've had coins around forever, right? Employing people who are formerly incarcerated, not an innovation. There's people doing it. Defy Ventures does a great job in starting entrepreneurship. There's people doing it. Putting all of those things together designed off of empathy and defining what the issue was, that's innovation. Innovation doesn't have to be technology. It can be defining an issue, rapid prototyping. Those tokens cost me $400 to print. It equated to over $3 million in what we call column buy, which is coverage, right? So we've never had a PR organization. We don't do that. We have, and it was terrible one time. We don't do that. If you create great, and you do good, stories will naturally be covered. So in your business, going back to the question we were just talking about, that's how you gain this wave of momentum is by creating things that are interesting, that are helpful, that allow people to see things. Um, so that token program has been running for eight years and obviously not running during COVID, but we cracked 160,000 redemptions the month before we closed. Uh, I've launched that program in San Francisco, in um, Buffalo, New York, all over the place. Uh, and the other part about creating these things is that they should be free. So somebody said, we have to get patents on this. We have to register this. I was like, register what? Patent what? What are we talking about? And they're like the token program. You have to make sure we have all the URLs. And I was like, that's silly. What we can do is show people we're not going to lose anything. Like we're playing with this mindset of like mine. It's not, it's not mine. It's to anybody who wants free source matters. Right. So anybody who wants to do this, of course we would coach and cater like to them and, and help them out. But it's really important to be able to share those things. Um, so yeah, that was a token project, which actually led into me working on the digital project of that with, if people aren't carrying things, how could we interact via our phone? Um, which is a whole other very long story that we won't go into today. Uh, but yeah, that's the token project, So, Thank you so much. I really wanted you to share it because uh, talking about innovation uh, in, in this field, I think is helpful. Also because uh, now actually we, we are building something together with this group. And um, from this week, they're going to start to really map out which are the challenges of uh, their communities. So from tomorrow, uh, they're going to start to collect the ingredients. And we will arrive at the end of, of the month where, with a hackathon where actually they have to work on something that we hope is going to become a successful project that is going to benefit the, the community they live in or anyway, a project that is real, that is tangible. Beautiful. So I think it's pre pretty inspiring uh, what you were sharing. So let's pick some question from uh, from the group because I think that they've been writing a lot uh, while we were talking. And another question, just building uh, on the business side, that's sure. about funding, because mm -hmm. all those uh, amazing ideas needs to get fun. For sure, you talk about the, the differentiation of the business, so doing many things, trying to create the most value that you can from everything. But for sure, you're also talking with investors, with business people every single day. And this is also my daily challenge. So I'm doing something tangible, creating a huge community with a lot of also intangible values. But then, uh, 
we are in the market. So probably this is pretty interesting to, to know how you were playing with that. I want to answer this very honestly um, because I think it's important to also talk about possibilities. Uh, I only have one investor and only in one business and they invested a small amount in the scheme of things. Everything that we've built aside from our biggest project was done off of sweat equity, management and leveraging of relationship of landlord, right? Your most important asset in a brick and mortar business is your lease. People like don't think about this and they don't do the metrics. They don't do the math. Like math is so, so, so important. And it's easy. <clears throat> it's easy to understand what your business is going to do. People get lost in these projections and they get carried away of like what they think. And they always overestimate and they disappoint themselves. I underestimate all the time. I always say we're going to do less than I think we can do. Because I think it's important to like reach success and hit bigger milestones. So when we were doing business, I was very honest with myself. Like, what is the fine dining restaurant I want? Well, the one I want to build is $2 million. What I have, including credit card debt, is $89,000. So I was like, well, I guess you can't open a restaurant. I was like, wrong. I just need to find the right one. So I found a failed restaurant in a neighborhood that nobody was trying to go to and believed that by employing and working with the right partners, we could create enough buzz to be a destination, right? So I believe we can be a destination. And so I found a heritage building. Again, nobody wanted. We signed a lease for $1,000 a month because there was a demo clause, which meant in a year they could destroy it and build a tower. And I thought in that year, a thousand bucks a month versus 10,000, I could build enough buzz that we could attract people who would want to build us a restaurant. So that's my rapid prototype. My rapid prototype was my first restaurant. I was like, how do we do it? There was a hood vent already. Exhaust was all in. Plumbing was all in. It was all there. And so we walked in. We worked with artists. I worked with friends. We literally built it ourselves. In that year, the first year that we opened Benita, it was the most award-winning restaurant in Canada. When I accepted our award for best new restaurant, <clears throat> the gentleman who was in second place was in the front row and he had opened a restaurant called the shore club. And I looked at him and I was like, he's a friend. I said, I'm pretty sure your carpet costs more than my whole restaurant. Right. And he nodded. He said, yeah. I was like, cool. Money should not be the center point of any of your designs. It ruins them all. It breaks it. It's not about that. It's not. You have to have sustainable cash flow for sure, but you have to build things that you know will work. So $1,000 a month with three owners working who had partners who could support them if we didn't make any money for the first six months. We had supplier relationships that were willing to give us the best pricing because they believed in our vision. We had artists that were willing to show on our walls because they were beautiful. I had a 30 foot piece in there because it's just such a stunning place. We knew how to hustle. We knew that we had followings already. <clears throat> and we knew worst case scenario, I would go back to cooking or bartending and everybody else would do the same. And we would have some debt. So I don't want to make this like about putting together seed funding or any of those sorts of things. I think if you're starting your first business, you should be as modest as you possibly can. Right? Do a food cart. <laughs> like literally do something to prove that it works. Then go talk to people because they're going to ask you who the hell you are. When I went to talk to people, if I wanted to, I could say, Oh, I'm the most award-winning restaurateur in Canada. That's who I am. they be like, Oh, I will back that horse. Instead. I was like, I don't want any of your money because then I have to deal with you. <laughs> and then when I'm trying to innovate, I got to listen to you and I don't want to listen to you. I want to listen to people. And so our next business, same thing. We leverage the success of that restaurant into a long-term lease place. I still own right out here. 11 years, 11 years this June, um, a slow food restaurant and cocktail bar. I leveraged that because it was like, come look at this restaurant we built. I was like, can you believe that we built this for $89,000? And the guy who owned the building was so impressed that we didn't have any partners or any debt. He was like, let me give you a five-year lease for pennies. Like, great. And then I said, would you be willing to give us any tenant improvement allowance? 
And he said, well, typically that's reserved for large businesses, et cetera. I was like, I know, but we want to improve the building. And he did. He gave us money. He's like, yeah, of course. What do you want to do? And I was like, I want to improve this, this, and this. Same thing. We went in and built that restaurant for under $100,000. It was paid off in three months. We didn't have any debt. So now you've got cash flow. The next business I did, <clears throat> $900 rent. We did a, a streetwear line and this, this beautiful like artist space, then a sushi restaurant, then a gallery, then a live music venue and just kept leveraging up. So when the landlords are part of the deal, you don't have to take in tons of money. He's like, all right, let's get this open together. Let's see what it looks like. And let's have lots of outs for safety. And so whenever we build something, I am, I'm the guy that's like, how can we do it for nothing? I'm not trying to say, let's raise $5 million. I would, those words would never literally come out of my mouth. That scares me because your vision is then manipulated. And I've watched it for three decades. I've watched people fail because an investor bails. A dear, dear, dear friend of mine. Last week, her name is Chef Suzanne Barr. She's one of the most talented chefs, period. She spoke at the Mad Symposium on being a, a black mother and a chef at the same time. She lost a restaurant and a partner in this place called True True Diner that hired Ethiopian first landed immigrants, trained them in, in proper diaspora food, exceptional community space. We were partnered with them and they lost their space. I said, what happened? And she said, our investors were taking money from the government in this relief. They didn't give us any. They didn't have the conversation with us and we didn't have the deal we needed. And they screwed us. I said, cool, tell everybody. She said, what? I said, tell everybody, right? Like, I'm just thinking in my mind, I'm sending her energy. I'm like, tell everybody. And she told everybody. She was in three major Toronto newspapers yesterday. In this moment of Black Lives Matter, these white <laughs> investors decided it would be a good idea to screw over one of the most incredible black female chefs. And she will now have anything that she wants. Her ticket is written because she operated with integrity. She did the right thing. She always looked after her community first. All of the things I've talked about today, Suzanne Barr is a living, breathing example of. She'll never have to worry about money, ever. Because every restaurateur or real estate person in Toronto is gonna scramble to give her a space. Now, are they doing it for the right reasons? Maybe not, but she knows how to write the deal. And she'll make sure that this next space is immaculate and impeccable and like not leveraged, right? So why I tune this away from money is you can learn, you can tune into Gary Vee and listen about money all day long and figure out how you should be on TikTok and LinkedIn more and all that bullshit. That's a completely different conversation, right? And I'm not saying it's an irrelevant one. I'm just saying that it's not relevant to social justice. And social justice comes from here and here and here. There's no way to game the system, right? And I think that people talk about it all the time. And they chase this unicorn thing. They, they, they just believe in it. And it's just not real. I lived in Silicon Valley for a year and I just watched people like literally commit suicide because that their series A didn't go well. Like, where are we at as a civilization that we care so much about an app that we're willing to lose our life? So we've gotten really, really confused. And uh, why I love this family and why I'll always work with, with Sarah and the team is there is a better way. There is a way of working within your means, with integrity uh, and honoring the struggle of it all. But when you are looking to do something bigger, especially when, and again, I, I want to be really, really clear, taking money and doing investment rounds and doing all those things is totally normal and it's fine. It's not my way, but it's absolutely the way that a lot of the world operates and people do it with great honor and integrity and have great partners. I want to just add that as a caveat before I slag it all too much. It works and it's great if that's your thing, 100%. If you're going to do that, you just need to make sure that you're honest and you never ever conflate or overinflate. Those two things you can never do. Just be honest. And if the person who you're speaking to doesn't get your vision, stop wasting your breath. Go to the next person immediately, right? If you can convince somebody in your vision, that's dangerous because that means that they're holding on 
to you convincing them. You have to constantly convince them or sell them. That's not the energy you want. If you're in partnership with somebody, you need that energy coming this way. The support should be coming this way. I believe in your vision. How much do you need? What can we do this month? Let's have a look at the books. Oh, that looks like it was tough. What are we going to do together? I've got another friend who can help out. That's what that relationship should sound and look like. <clears throat> if it looks like anything else, you can't do your job. How could you possibly do your job and focus on changing the world if you've got somebody over here, predominantly white men, 90 plus percent, ego-driven narcissists, telling you what to do when they don't know anything about what you do? So this is dangerous, is all I'm saying. And what do you want to do with your life and how do you want to spend it is, is I guess, how I'll, I'll bring that in. Thank you. Every time I listen your words, uh, I feel better because I feel that I'm not alone. So thank you so much for reminding me why and how I'm doing things. So <laughs> really. And I think that the entire Future Food team uh, now understands many of the things and of the choices and decisions that every single day we, we take. So thank you so much. My pleasure been really inspiring as usual so we still have like nine minutes it's like gold this nine minutes so i really invite you guys to take advantage of this time with mark but then mark is very active on every social media and we we can share i really would love you to share also your if you have pictures of the things that you do because you're doing amazing things every time he does things he is always, uh, everything is always curated. The soul, the sound, the, the world, the rhythm of, uh, of things happening. So I, I really would love them to also to experience because we cannot share a meal tonight. This is the sure. biggest lack because generally we are always together around a table or in a kitchen or in a barbecue, random barbecue in Iceland. So oh. the, 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 the way generally we meet. <laughs> Iceland was so incredible and, and to paint the picture and then take it backwards of creation. So if you want people, we went, we talked about soft advocacy through events, right? And we talked about holding that space uh, in Iceland and working with, with Sarah and the team. I love challenges. I love being dropped in the jungle with like one oil burner and say cook for 300 people and we figure it out. That's, that's why you train. That's why you like get ready for all of this is, is that the challenge is the same challenge we have in life is the same challenge that we have um, as advocates is you are always bucking against what is normative behavior, right? What is normative behavior? So I created events that I call anti-galas. And I say that in small text, right? I don't like put that on the poster, but I, I hate galas. I think they are one of the single biggest wastes of resources and people's time that have ever been. Okay. So and I've cooked hundreds of them. I literally did one for 2000 a year ago and I, I do it because I love my partners that we will work with. And that one was for the American refugee committee and I care about them deeply and we were able to innovate with it. But why, why do we invest all of this time, effort, energy boards, car sponsors, there's so many sponsors that by the time you're eating your terrible salad, you've listened to a hundred different people you don't care about. Like, and they don't care about being there. So if you've ever been to a white tablecloth Maserati in the parking lot, terrible, like energetically gala, we all hate these things. And we end up, like, I, we get invited by cousins of friends, et cetera, because nobody wants to go to them. But somebody's been, you know, leveraged into through relationship, buying a $5,000 table. And then there'll be like one great speaker amongst it somewhere. But the rest of it is people walking up one after another. They don't want, they don't want to read that. They don't want to be there. That's not the thing. So we create places of expression. And the rigor from the F&B industry is there. Everything is managed. Everything is there, but it feels more effortless and we spend very little. Uh, so the dinner that we did in Bushwick, of course, very similar. We spent very little money, but it was revolutionary for people. So we actually changed their mindset 
because they're not sitting down to the same goblet of stale ice water doing the rubber chicken. They're like, what is this? Your son's printing 3D pancakes. Like it's, it's all about what everybody else can bring to the table because energetically it's tangible. You know when you've walked into something special, you know it, you just feel it instantly. You walk in like, whoa, this is, I may feel out of sorts for a moment, but what's going on here? What is this magic? And the magic is true belief in everything that's going on. So in Iceland, I'll give you two quick analogies from that trip because I think it we was- We were in Iceland this morning. So this morning we were there with one of our mission with all the Icelandic team. So- we were, Yeah. That's my guy. That's my guy right there. Um, so we're, we arrive in Iceland and I don't know what I'm getting into, but I know that it's going to be fun. And we're going to go foraging. I've never foraged in Iceland. I've never been to Iceland. We're going to create these beautiful meals for people. And I get, once I get something in my head, I'm like, we have to do it. And we had a couple other cooks. I had one of my chefs with me, but they were involved in the design thinking sprint. So I'm driving around in what I think they're called a panda. The yeah. car was the same size as me. It, just this little car driving around Iceland, trying to find enough stuff to feed people. And it became a challenge to say what's available, what's important and what can we do? So I tested my own assumptions around farmed fish in Vancouver, British Columbia to say those two words together, you could expect to be in a fist fight pretty quickly because farmed fish in British Columbia has ruined our natural supply. It has destroyed our stocks. It is literally the devil out here. We get to Iceland and Gunnar says to me, we have beautiful farmed salmon. I'm like, whoa, what did you say? And he said, we have farmed salmon. I was like, I told you I'm a cook, right? Like we don't, we don't use farm salmon. He's like, oh no, it's beautiful. And my head is exploding. I'm like, I need fish. We have to cook dinner. I got to use farmed fish. I don't think I can do this. Like my, my moral integrity is having real issue with this until I saw the fish farm. So fish farms aren't the problem. Where they're placed is the problem. And this one was placed in a place where it didn't impact the ecosystem in any way and actually produced enough fish to feed almost the entire country. It was crazy, their production levels and the quality was exceptional. So we cooked this fish and I debunked my own narrative around farmed fish. So the gift of putting yourself in somewhere and not holding or blocking yourself off from what's possible, but actually learning and realizing that sometimes the problem is not what we think it is. The problem is actually the application or the, the system around it or all of the other things that impact farmed fish. Sometimes it's not bad. Sometimes it actually could be our future. As we say farmed, we think about these horrible conditions. I saw a lot of happy fish, I gotta tell you. And they were delicious. So we, we, I insisted on cooking outside and roasting them on a barbecue that didn't work. It looked like it was literally from the Viking times. Um, and we managed to find enough fuel to get it going. And we cooked this fish and stuffed it with all of the things that we had foraged and we ate together. And we talked about this, that the system itself wasn't the issue, right? It was the way that it was being applied. That was the problem. Um, I think we've got two minutes left and I'm just looking at this last question. Could you speak to I how some of yeah, what can I take it? Because actually, thanks to the dinner that we organized together in Bushwick, mm -hmm. in New York, where we mm -hmm. had all the diplomats uh, joining us in the morning, uh, talking about food waste and uh, the need really to implement uh, rules and uh, technology solution to solve this issue. Thanks to that dinner, those diplomats that were there at the dinner, they have been working together and in December, so after four months out of our experience together, they actually were able to convince the entire United Nations Assembly to sign the first resolution declaring the first day of food loss and waste. And they never thought before. So this year on September 29th, it was gonna be the UN World 
day of advocacy against food loss and waste. And this started a huge movement of organization in every single country because all the delegates at the UN, of course, started sharing that. And now this year is going to be launched. So it's been amazing. This those people that knows about food waste probably because it happens every day in their kitchen. But totally. then you know, the morning speech we had, then we took them at the Google canteens to see how they manage food waste. Then we took them in a journey. And at the dinner, we made the, the dinner in Bushwick. So not in the fancy Manhattan place, but in Bushwick. Totally. Amazing experience. And at the end, I remember you sharing uh, with Jose the recipes and saying, hey, guys, uh, with the two of us, we have been cooking garbage for you. <laughs> That was the starting point of a process. And Claudia and I, we have been working behind the scene and that happens. And the people that were pushing that were at the dinner. So this is an example. This is happening every single day. Then probably you have hundreds of other stories, but that, this was happening exactly one year ago. It's so beautiful. And I'll, I'll leave you guys. We're going to go over time by two minutes, but on the UN day, um, we were sat in a U-shaped table. So here's the thing, who's become a very good friend of mine, um, Antonio Parenti, was yeah. there. And so I'm sat like this in the UN. I show up in my Jordans and jeans and a T-shirt. I don't know what proper attire for the UN is. I figure this is my this is my outfit. So I show up and I sit down in my seat and there's not a name. Everybody has a name card, but I don't have one. And you so, have your one. So Antonio walks up to me. He doesn't know me. And he says, um, media are actually supposed to sit in the back. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I got up and I moved. I don't know if you remember this. Or I left my seat and I went and sat in the back. And so as we're getting started, Sarah's like, Mark, your seat's over here. And Antonio kind of looks and he's in like this beautiful $10,000 suit. And he's looking at me. And then I sit down and they had handwritten me a placard for my name at the, at the UN. All right. This is so good. And so I sit down. And people start, they have time. You imagine how many people have been gathered for this conversation. The amount of pressure on this moment, well, look what was created. We know the results, so we're happy. But the amount of pressure on this moment is huge, right? And so it's also my first time at the UN, so I'm geeked. I'm like, oh my God, I'm at the United Nations. Uh, I'm so excited to talk. And people start to talk and I start to get really upset. I'm like, they're wasting so much time introducing themselves. I know who you are. Well, just talk about the points. Like, let's get to the points. And it comes to me. I'm like, is it okay if I speak last? Because I, I really wanted to, to finish. And I'm, I never write my talks ever. I never, ever do. I've got my laptop open and I'm furiously writing. And my team is there. They're like, what are you writing? Are you okay? I'm like, yes, this is important. And so I'm writing away and I've never read a talk. I speak professionally for like seven years. I've never, ever read, written a talk or read one. And I was like, I have to read this. And only the first line really matters. The first thing that I said was, in the time that we've sat here and spoke, 14,192 people have died from hunger. And we have more than enough food on the planet to feed everybody. That's what we need to know. And we skipped the introductions and we just went straight into it. And it was, I think, one of the most beautiful days of my life, like getting to hang out with you guys and do that talk. And then Antonio came up to me afterwards and he was teary eyed and he said, can I give you a hug? And he's like, I'm very sorry that I judged you. And I said, that's okay. People have been doing it my whole life. I'm used to it. And he invited me for dinner and we've become friends since, but this is the last lesson, which is judging a book by its cover. We know that we shouldn't, but we do. And so people who are living in poverty, who are living in the street, I ask, I implore you, to not judge, but to try and make a new friend and to spend some time understanding why people end up in that way. And then using your political voice, will, ability, vote, wherever you are in the world um, to try and make it a better place. Thank you guys. Thank you. Please, we should really clap our hands with the mics on because uh, after this hour and a half i think it's really thank you so much mark for this gift thank my honor so my honor and pleasure as always and i'm so excited to see what you guys create you make sure to check back in with me at the end of the class and let me know how it's all gone 
And um, like Sarah said, I'm, I'm on Come to Italy, Italy, Mark. Come to Italy. Come to, to visit us. He's going to come in Polica. I hope that he's not going to be quarantined, but he's going to be with us at the boot camp in Polica in September. So I'm coming, go. Jeff. I'm coming. They're going to put me on a boat by myself. I'm going to sail. Bring Tom Hanks coconut with me, and we're going to come. All right, you guys. Lots of love. Be safe out there. Have a great day in Vancouver and we send you highs from Africa, India, everywhere in the world for someone probably is one in the middle of the night. So Lots of love, all our love to you, Mark. Keep going doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So Bye. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.